I'll wait till I can see us on the stream and then we'll start talking. You guys don't no. hear a child screaming in the background, do you? No. No. Love this Yeti mic. No one besides mine. <laughs> no screaming. All right. We are live. Great. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, normally, you see us playing various uh, tabletop games uh, over here on Rivals of Waterdeep. Uh, we've been playing a lot of uh, D&D, but most recently um, in our off season, we've been playing a awesome system called Kids on Bikes. Um, and we're happy to be joined uh, by the co-designers uh, of Kids on Bikes, uh, D Doug Lewandowski and John Gilmore. Uh, welcome. Uh, Thank, you for having us. Say, huh? Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Guess we should say who we are first. I'm Sharif Jackson. <laughs> uh, and Masood Hawk, our uh, Kids hey, on Bikes DM, is mm -hmm. also here. Um, yeah, so so yeah, it's, it's been a, a fascinating system that we've been working with. So um, why don't y'all start off by just telling us just like the origin story, like how'd you come up with the idea, um, and like how that was actually executed into a into a product. Sure. So, God, what was it? Four summers ago. I think so. Um, when Stranger Things came out, I watched that, and I was exclusively into board game and card game design back then. Um, and, you know, watched a couple episodes and like posted on Facebook, like, all right, who's doing the Stranger Things board game with me that like mm -hmm. already started cooking in my head. Mm -hmm. And John responded and said, uh, I'm actually working on one already. And I was like, oh, can I get in on that? Um, and he said, well, no, because uh, he already <laughs> had he already had somebody working with him on it. And um, he said, but we should do an RPG. Um, and so we kicked around a bunch of ideas. Uh, I made a bunch of overly complicated suggestions. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we eventually streamlined, 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 streamlined until we got to uh, what we wound up with. One of my, uh, my favorite stories from the early days on it was, um, we're talking about how in like Stranger Things, Dungeons and Dragons kind of feels like a a little bit of a character in the in the show or you know the side thing that kind of permeates it yeah and we wanted some odes to like D, &D you know because that's what we grew up playing and um dud was like what if we brought back that um which for people who haven't played second edition uh is one of the worst game design things ever it's terrible <laughs> yeah it's just extra math on top of math okay. um and I was like, no, the no. Part that and then, everyone loves about role playing games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hold up. Let me bust out my calculator. Yeah. <laughs> Check this table. Right there. Um, but once we dismissed that, we started talking about that subject more. And that's how we came up with the idea of using a full set of polyhedrals for the stats. Yeah. I really loved when I first came across that. I think it was just so interesting to explain and like bring up the fact that. There are no modifiers other than what you, like, yeah, you, what you put yourself in, other, other than what you earn through the adversity tokens, but, like, you innately just have this ability, and that feels, I don't know, I like the intuitiveness in a role play of, like, hey, I'm going to try this, uh, if it's, like, a planned action, I'm going to try this thing, it might seem weird. That character's doing it right at that moment. They might just have a more likelihood, but they could also just completely biff it, or, like, yeah, no, I really dug that sort of um, design aesthetic because uh, then it also builds out and feeds into the role play in a fun way. Yeah, we really wanted it to, and we wanted that kind of like power disparity in each, in each player mm -hmm. um, character of having like some things you're really good at and some things you're mediocre at. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, Go ahead. it had a dual purpose of preventing min-maxing, which we didn't want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And originally when we were first working on it, we, one of the first things that we were really thinking about in designing it was this idea of duality, right? Like a complementary opposites and, um, and all that. And initially the stats were paired. And so fight and flight went together. And if you had I a D20 that, yeah. in fight, you necessarily had a D4 in flight, mm. right. um, charm and grit and brains and brawn. And so those were always at odds with each other. 
Um, mm -hmm. And then if you had like uh, your D8 and your D10 stat repaired and your D6 and your D12 stat repaired. Sure. But after a couple of play tests, we just said, you know, like that's too, like you can have smart, strong guys. Like that's mm -hmm. fine. Like you can have uh, a, a tough and charming character. Like it doesn't have to, it's things aren't that binary with people. Yeah. Um, and so we, we moved away from that, which I'm glad about, but that was a sort of like initial design that got mm -hmm. play tested out. I really appreciate hearing that because I, I like feel it when I'm playing the game, the idea of letting folks at the table uh, provide nuance, like especially as uh, your character building, as you're building the world, it is a lot of, um, I think, at least while reading through it, like one of the first steps is uh, what are your boundaries for everybody? What's everyone sitting at the table with? And I like while we were doing it, we we're like, hey, we can set this game in any time period at, at, that we want. And we're like, well, we're all people of color on Rivals. So not any time period, technically. And I don't know, I had a moment I was like, no, any time period, because this mm -hmm. is a game. And I can we can do whatever we want with it. The game allows it to be like designed as such. Um, and to see that like sort of played through, at least in the thought process of the other mechanics as you build like a role-playing game, um, it was really nice to feel. Cool. Thank you. I'm glad you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think w one one of the most fun things I had was at the beginning when we were um, sort of building the world together, right? So we had these questions that we were kind of doing in like a round robin way, where like we were each kind of filling in details and kind of playing off of each other, um, which I felt was was great. Um, was there any sort of discussion if you wanted to have sort of a set world that you had or or l l like did did like you begin with that or like did you begin with the current thing where like everyone builds it like together i think we started with the collaborative world building right yeah. away because that was something that i really liked about um powered by the apocalypse games and doug i don't think i'd played any ptba a couple yeah but not or pvta um yeah but you hadn't played yeah so that was the conversation that we had and i really liked that like the relationship building and the world building so we mm -hmm. kind of really wanted to like do even more of that yeah and in terms of stuff that got iterated most probably those those character relationship questions we tested those probably half of our play tests were focused on those mm -hmm. um, even if it included other stuff we Put, really put those through the ringer because we wanted that to be what generates the story um and like you were talking about before with like the whole improv thing before we went live um, yeah no i was gonna say like i really love that collaborative style uh I, as a background like I'm, I'm an actor i'm an improviser here in chicago and um that felt really intuitive for me in terms of like how we're building the world of like the layered facts that we all agree to um and because it's done in a round robin uh it feels very equitable as well so like you're able to like really provide input and have it i might have one idea of where it's going when i ask my question um but the question before me might completely shift it or i might be hit with something that i wasn't expecting and that i think really allows um for it to feel really real um, in the way that uh, even the uh, sometimes nonsensical things you say as a joke, like feels grounded almost because uh, with everything else happening, all the other input, it kind of gets leveled out. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and like, it just provides that, ma that amazing, like sense of investment, you mm -hmm. know, because I remember after we had our first session zero, when we kind of built everything, I was like, ready to just jump in you know Where, whereas i feel like you know when like you're playing in like a more standard like campaign that a dm either homebrews or you know or builds off of a, a campaign there's sort of there's a sense of mystery that the players have yeah. as they're going in there's still a sense of mystery here but like you're like well i know the boundaries because i helped to create them mm -hmm. um and then up. Oh, of course, like Masood, he takes that and he turns it all around and he uh, 
and he like plays around with it but like i just love that like i i remember i felt like even though we spent like you know three hours on our session zero like uh, building everything i was like hey let's let's just jump in right now <laughs> right you know? nice it's fun especially like i what ends up feeling to me really driving for the surreal or like the now that you've built like this idyllic or non-idyllic like uh small town or small um neighborhood um, the rumors, the rumors were really fun. Like hearing what other people sort of lay what and would become the thematic running point of whatever you're dealing with. Um, yeah, because I, I, for me, when I was building out our campaign, one of the things came up um, was that there was a peach farm in upstate New York, and I was like, peaches are from Georgia. Like they don't. I don't, I don't think the land in upstate New York would be tenable for that. But I was like, okay, fine. We run with it. And then someone said the man who runs the peach farm was a serial murderer. And I was like, okay, well, those two have to be linked now. Um, <laughs> and like, that was the rumor that they got built out of like one of the truths. And I was like, perfect. Let's run this and we could go. Um, and that, yeah, I, once again, like just the, the ever so delicious, but ever so tall sandwich um, that the game becomes is, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And anytime I GM, I love to use those rumors as like, these are the things that your character believes, right? But like, mm -hmm. growing up, we all had these things we believed about like, you know, like my sixth grade teacher was a bodybuilder, like you could not convince me otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> even though we were like, Mr. Nelson, you're a bodybuilder, right? And he's like, No, I just I work out to stay healthy. Like, that's what I do. We're like, but like Mr. Universe, right? Um, and so like in my head, that was absolutely true. And so as a, when I GM, I love to play with those. And like, if, if you're saying like these two are spending all this time together, because um, I think this is an example we have in the book, like the principal and the vice principal are having an affair. And that's why like, they're always like, we see them together outside of school. That's the rumor. The truth is they're part of a secret organization. Exactly. Right. 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 And then yeah. to sort of like play into that, and then pull the rug out is a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I was waiting for you. Oh, um, yeah, and I was gonna say, it kind of goes into like, where some of the safety tools are great too. Like it lets the players give input into the campaign. Like if, you know, Dud says like, oh, I heard there's ghosts in this school. Like it lets me as a GM know like, oh, well, he's really interested in that. So I can kind of focus and let him make that shine at some point too. Mm, absolutely. I like, well, like speaking of safety tools, one of the things that jumped out to me was the intention. I, I, and I'd love to hear about like whether the intentionality came out, but the level to um, ableism and accessibility are like not really a deterrent in your character design. Um, and I, I really appreciated that, at least in the rule book, um, yeah. like basically stating it out, like you can have this person and they can roll a fight check. They can still do that, even if um, they might not be physically able to in this, like you can create a narrative around it. Um, and I'd love to hear from you all uh, if that would like, how did that sort of topic or like where, where did that sort of, uh, yeah, what was the conversation that might've led to that? Yeah, we, um... So we had it out for playtesting, and one of the people who was reading over the rules sent both of us an email and said, hey, you know, I love this system. I really like that, um, you know, you have these, uh, you know, these strengths and these flaws. Um, and I really want to play a character who's like me. Like I was born with, uh, born with physical disabilities, and I'll have them all my life. Um, and so if I were building a character based on myself, would my flaw be that I'm, I'm disabled in the way I am? Mm -hmm. um, and that just like, that crushed me, right? Like mm -hmm. we have a player who's like passionate about this, who's like, okay, cool. I wanna play this game. And I guess the best way for me to interpret this is that like the way I am is a flaw. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man. Um, and so John and I talked about that. Um, and we worked, <coughs> we put a lot of effort into that section and having it be with, uh, with Anton's help, the, the guy who sent us the email, um, yeah. to try to get it to be really clear, like you were saying, that this is, 
this is something that makes your character who you are. It's not a flaw. It's not a weakness. It, it just, it is. Um, exactly. And I mean, John and I always, always, I mean, one of the things we bonded over early on, even before we started working on this was just our absolute belief that games are for everybody mm -hmm. and that everybody who sits down at the table should feel like they're welcome at the table, should feel happy to be at the table, should feel valued at the table. Mm -hmm. And, and so that email from Anton really made us realize like we have to, we have to build that in. It's not mm -hmm. just because we feel that certain way about gaming yeah. that might not come through in the rules, right? Just because we feel it doesn't mean we've said it. Mm -hmm. um, and so going through and making sure that that was super, super explicit was, um, yeah, came out directly out of, out of Anton's email. Hell yeah. Well, thank you, Anton. And I really like, I don't know, the conversation and the inclusion that comes into its design is, it makes it so everyone can have that investment, which I think was really nice. Uh, and Sharif, I'd love to hear from like a players and like, yeah, uh, what was it like walking into session one, having that like between session zero and one, like mm -hmm. what was that like after building the world? And then like, okay, now we're going to set foot in it. Um, I mean, at first I, I didn't quite know how to handle it because I was like, do I know too much? Mm. You know, like, <laughs> like as a player, like, do I know too much about the world? You know, like, um, I knew that you would throw in some stuff, but I was a little worried that I wouldn't have that same feeling of like, wow, I'm in an entirely new place. I could have never imagined, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I was a little worried about that. Um, but when I went into the first game, it, it was almost like, and I don't know if I, this is intentional, but I felt comfortable. Like I felt like this is a city that I know but there's going to be things happen that I don't know, you know? So it, so it actually helped me to get into the, to the mentality of the character as somebody that's familiar with the festival and these rumors and the peach farm and stuff. So like, those aren't really like spoilers, I guess, even though I was worried like, Oh man, I'm spoiled by some of this stuff, <laughs> but those are things that any character that lives in this town, like would know. You know, so like it kind of gets you in the sort of this is the everyday mundane stuff, you know, um, and then the sort of like surprises are what you know, like, you know, are, are what, what the GM is able to, 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 to like come with. And like, yes, it's based on some of the rumors and stuff that we talked about, mm -hmm. but it's in such a unique way um that it was still a surprise so like i really like that the collaborative storytelling made me feel like i was a citizen like i was a member of this place yeah you know i think it was really cool to also do the relationship questions after that because it seemed even though like with any with any adventuring party you know there's a rule of like something brings you all together before uh, the adventure starts right and at least the way your character was designed um, was they didn't know them, um, right? He was like mm -hmm. relatively, uh, was yeah. a character that m nobody in the group knew. Um, but because of the small town atmosphere and like doing those questions, you still were able to like, like in any moment and you live in like these spaces, um, have your insights, I'd say, about other individuals. Um yeah, and I, 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 because I, I loved watching your role play with Tanya's character because of those questions. Because like it immediately show up, I knew why you were behaving the way you were behaving, and like other people at the table already got it, but we didn't have to say it as explicitly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was, it was a really cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, as as like a player, just going in that session, I was like, oh, I'm, I live here. <laughs> I live here now. Yeah. <laughs> and what's going to happen? Um, yeah. So one, one thing, one thing that was also interesting for me to like experience as like a player was the concept of like failing and adversity tokens. Mm -hmm. Really curious as to how y'all came about that, because I know like, you know, being playing mostly like a D and D, like, you know, like when you roll a one or you roll low, you know, like there's no real advantage or no like, positivity to it you know <laughs> um so so, so yeah how how did you come across you know, like how 
How'd you come to the uh, way that failure is handled in the game? Go ahead, Dave. Oh, okay. Um, Cause that was mostly you like that was, uh, but yeah, early on when we were talking about it, um, that's something that uh, Powered by the Apocalypse does really well too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the, the core things that John was really big on when we were working on this about the, everything should feel narrative, right? A, a success is narrative, a failure is narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and that idea that, uh, and this is something I learned from playing Fiasco, that a success or a failure is what the character is after. But for the table, everything should be a success, right? Mm -hmm. if, if my character tries to outrun the monster but gets caught, that should still feel like a success for the table because it's, it's going to push the story in this different, interesting way. Yeah. Um, but also to sort of encourage people to feel good about failure, that's where that idea of the adversity tokens came in, where, mm -hmm. okay, you, you may have, you know, boffed it on this one, but you can next time contribute to this or you can use those adversity tokens for your strengths. Um, and that there is that sort of benefit to having that resilience to get back up after a failure and, mm -hmm. and keep going. Um, yeah, and there's, there's kind of a couple things that um, we really wanted to do in the design. And one of those was we always wanted to design towards big moments because i think that's the thing yeah. that makes games super memorable when you have those you know huge moments like the exploding dice is another thing that really factors mm -hmm. into that like when somebody rolls you know their four-sided die and it explodes repeatedly like we were originally just going to limit it to one explosion mm -hmm. and then we we're like well, why not just let it explode as many times as it can because that'll be incredible when it does um, but like the, the adversity tokens too factor into that. Like you can save them up and have these huge moments where, you know, everybody works together. You know, your friend fails that role trying to get over the fence, running away from the killer, but everybody throws in adversity tokens and they all like help pull them over at the last second mm -hmm. and you just barely scrape by, but it's this memorable moment. So it factors into that. Um, and the other thing is we wanted to kind of bring in some like, board game mechanics because yeah. in my board game design I always tried to lift things from RPGs like there's a lot of RPG inspired stuff in like Dead of Winter mm -hmm. um, but like in this we wanted the board game style mechanics we wanted skills to feel mechanical and not um, you know just like oh I have swimming so I get plus one whenever I try to swim right like, that's not very exciting we wanted you know cool skills that you could spend stuff on mm -hmm. um, so that was why we wanted to, you know, make sure we were generating a lot of adversity tokens so the players could play with them all the time and do stuff and keep doing that fun thing. And it kind of feels like you're learning a lesson and that you're using that to your advantage in whatever way, shape, or... And, I, like, even if it's not explicit, like, well, just because I failed that role from, like, early on in the session, I can still use that to my advantage. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and it once again coming from like an improviser background of like collaborative storytelling i love that i, I really like that because then it drives the narrative for it. like that is what everyone's focused on it isn't the min max i don't want to get the most damage possible on this big thing let's tell a cool story um and doing it collaboratively you're obviously going to see things and uh, with a system evoke things that a single na a narrator um, couldn't do mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, I have a question for you, Masood. Yeah. <laughs> as, as the GM, um, uh -huh. after you finished the session zero, like, did you finish it? Like, wow, these are, how am I going to put all these ridiculous ideas that everybody brought out here? Or like, was it more like, you know, you could instantly see how these things, um, kind of interlocked because i know yeah. i was thinking like man if i'm jamming this like you really have to mm -hmm. it's almost more challenging in one aspect than sort of going off of a book and homebrew you know and changing stuff so how as 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 a gm how do, how do you handle linking all these things together uh th honestly it was something that felt i needed to think about 
and like I got out of like there's so much stuff here I want to like sit on it mm-hmm. and then it came to me like it was really like what felt right because you guys the best way to describe it is like you guys gave me such good seeds like such great seeds and I wanted to list like let them soak let them sit and as they started to like grow I I really like it was like let's run with it because it could go anywhere and whatever I kind of did it within the bounds that we said that we're okay we're in the lines of like the game that we designed um it feels rewarding it feels um your your yield is fruitful um and yeah I don't know I really um was probably thinking about it throughout the week because thankfully we had a week in between and by the second day um I was I was so for it I'd also been watching Lovecraft Country so that was like a <laughs> little little bit inspiration for me um but Heard that's so good it's 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 great it's incredible. uh but yeah um so it, like for me that's how at least I developed the story or came with it um yeah I'd love to actually hear from you all about like one of the things that um, I think is fascinating is the positive and negative sides of the uh, relationship questions. And the, you, there's so many of them, uh, which is really like delightful to have in a space. Cause we, how many, we have uh, four, we have three other people who are playing um, our yeah. game and we did the full questions and we didn't, we maybe got to one that re-rolled that we had to like re-roll or pick another. There was like enough there to mine and like dig content from. Um, and I'd love to hear about you all. Like, how did that come about? How did that list? Um, we were like, this is the list we want to use or lists rather. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of it was brainstorming and play testing. I, I think they may have been a little bit shorter at first, but uh-huh. we really just kind of picked a number to start with. We, we went with, you know, that because mm-hmm. it could be common across them and it uses one of the dice that we were using. Absolutely. Um, but we knew that we wanted a lot there. So, you know, people wouldn't see repeats within the creation process. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we also wanted, like, even if you did see a repeat, they were kind of open-ended enough that you could interpret them in different ways, too. Yeah. And that um, when we first started, you know, a lot of them were more generic, right? Like... Mm-hmm what's a good memory you have with this character? Mm-hmm. And then um, our friend Jay Treat, who's a, a tabletop and role-playing game designer was like, uh, and, and I love just his like absolute honest feedback. He was like, hey, this is like a great idea. These questions are boring. Like, like, mm-hmm. do you go to school together? We we're like, yeah, okay, fine. Um, he was like, you know, like, um, when did you first realize you loved this character, either romantically or platonically? And we're like, go ahead. What other, what other? He's like, <laughs> um, yeah. <coughs> the question so are handful, needy. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, a handful they're, they're, came like directly yeah. from him. And then once that sort of clicked, it was like, because uh-huh. initially we were thinking, hey, if you have the sense of your character, mm-hmm. we want to make sure that these questions, like any of these questions can fit in. Mm-hmm. But then we, we shifted it sort of almost 180 to, you might have a sense of your character, but you might pull that question and go, huh, oh, I guess we're going in this direction then, right? Like, (laughs) I really um, love catching the folks off guard because I think that like that instant leads to a lot of fun inspiration as well for the design. Right. So like if you you do the full and you have a negative, an overall negative relationship with one character Mm -hmm. and then you, for your positive one role, when did you first realize you love this character? If you stick with that, you can always re-roll, right? And that was what we eventually settled on for like, well, if you get one where you're really like, this doesn't work. But if I get that one and I lean into it, then it's like, okay, why do I have this negative relationship with this character I love, right? Mm-hmm. Do we have mm-hmm. a past, right? Do we, were we like the very best of friends and they betrayed me in some way? And so now I still love them, but I don't ever want to talk to them again. Sure. Or, or do I have this like, overwhelming like it's beyond a crush man you don't understand kind of thing with them um or do or whatever right there's so many directions you go with it um and we wanted those really like in like uh in media analysis they were calling it back in the day uh pop right like those moments in a a tv show or a movie where like the whole audience just goes 
right? Like that big reveal or like whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted those moments right in character creation where it's like, oh, mm -hmm. like we're going this way now. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we definitely had those moments. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, I remember, like Masood would pull these questions out, and we would almost be more entertained by the questions themselves mm -hmm. than the possible answers. It was definitely like, "Whoa, <laughs> what is going on?" Yeah. You know, and and um, you're right in that it did help me to rethink my character, hearing some of the questions um, and the questions that like I had to answer as well. I had I had a lot less because I was kind of like on more of the not known. I wasn't really known. By a lot of the characters which i also think is like is like a great choice um but uh yeah yeah it was it definitely like having these spicier questions like it definitely kind of <laughs> like made the character creation like so this is the kind of game that this is okay okay all right you know and, it, it it like set that very well and i love that about it because it's definitely if you built your characters in a world that i had established i don't think i could have thought of making these dynamics or thinking of a way where they could come up organically. But because you drop folks in where like, hey, what is the backstory? What is, what is the backstory before? What's our prologue look like? Um, yeah, I think it gives it a really fun way to then built off and like move, um, which also I like, if we're gonna move, uh, if you don't mind me asking, like thinking about prologue and story, um, I'd love to hear more about your powered character. And like the design of like building a powered character, like no one in our group has a powered character. Um, but that's not to say some NPCs, I might not be using that to make things equitable in my certain design. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. Well, I mean, right away, that was a discussion we had because I mean, obviously, Eleven is awesome in Stranger Things. Mm -hmm. And even looking at like other stuff like, you know, E.T. or Goonies or, you know, mm -hmm. the other medias that we really dug into. Yeah. But we were like, well, if we if we let players be powered, like either every, everyone's going to want to be powered and have cool powers mm -hmm. or one player is going to be powered and everyone's going to feel like they're on the sidelines or they're just supporting that cool character. So that's when we started discussing like, well, what if we just made that shared control so like everybody had different aspects of it and got to equally participate in doing that but not you know not have just one person be that yeah yeah and it was i remember where we had the conversation but i don't because that was when you came out uh each summer usually not last summer obviously but each summer we do like a, a week long design retreat, either at my house or at John's house. And um, when we were working on that, we, I, it's funny because I remember where we were, but I don't remember who said which side, which is like <laughs> what I love about collaboration. Um, but we were going back and forth about this and somebody said, well, yeah, I mean, we should let, I mean, I guess it's more fun if everybody could play a powered character. And then the other person said, well, what if, everybody was playing the powered character mm -hmm. um, and it just sort of spiraled out from there well i think so. it, it feels fun because like look xander is great xander's a great addition to the to the scooby gang but uh everyone watches the show for buffy right but to feel as if we're building the story together as we're like sort of designing it um i think it feels really valuable to be like okay we all control like this person we all have the ability to build the narrative that then allows us to uplift this common thing. Um, well, yeah, which might be where uh, our session three goes, Sharif, we'll see. Um, <laughs> which is also like, uh, sorry, I like, I, I was reading the book and I loved it. Um, the choose of, like, I love the conversation around time existing between sessions and having folks like fill that gap. Mm -hmm. um, that is something I feel like most games that I play are, we pick up exactly where we left off. Like that was the cliffhanger moment. Um, what was the uh, like decision behind making, um, yeah, what was that decision like? Like to add some time between sessions? I think that got back to the, the media that we loved and sort of like, as we started working on it, it started out as a, based on Stranger Things, but then it sort of spiraled out into Mm -hmm. But it could also be E.T., but it could also be Goonies, but it could also be Stand By Me. Mm -hmm. um, 
and those in a TV series between seasons or in a, you know, if you have a movie with sequels between the first and the last, there's always like those big things that change, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we wanted to tap into that as a way to like, what are we doing now to like put some character tension back in, right? Because in a, a really good character story arc, Right, like Sharif, if your character is sort of the outsider, by the end of this this story, he'll be brought in, I assume. Yes. Right. And he'll he'll be connected, but there won't be that potential for like, well, who's this new guy? Right. Mm -hmm. So what can we add then in between to have those hooks, to have those things like mm -hmm. we resolved this rumor and this rumor, but now what's going on? Um, mm -hmm. and that I think really came out of the the considerations about the media that we consume that inspired us to to do this where stuff suddenly has changed between and there well even like relationship dynamics did they get resolved or not and what does that look like now right mm -hmm. did bad feelings fester or did would did something happen off screen that we'll later find out about that like kind of like i really enjoyed um yeah i really like that sort of play that you give um, it feels like you really wanted to build a sandbox that let people uh, do what they want, but still feel boxed. I don't want to mean this in a bad way, but like boxed in, like you were still in the yeah. world, no matter how you design or like play with mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, I joke around that like the, the role-playing game that I want to design mm -hmm. comes on an index card and it just <laughs> says, tell a great story with your friends. Um <laughs> I mean, like it gets down to that, right? I want, yeah. anytime I work on something, I want it to be something where mm -hmm. you you feel that. You feel like you have this unlimited possibility within these bounds, mm -hmm. right? Well, and an another big design philosophy that we talked about a lot was making it accessible to new gamers who haven't played RPGs before. Yeah. Because like I grew up in a really, really small town in upstate new york and nobody played D, &D. so like my mm -hmm. introduction to D, D was buying all the second edition books and trying to teach it to myself mm -hmm. and like they they are the worst written rule books in history because they don't actually teach you how to play the game right <laughs> they like give you the rules which is great but in, until you find a group and like really learn about it you know you you just stare at all this stuff and you understand the mechanics but not how right. and we wanted to do a lot of things, you know, even the questions are part of that design. Like it, you asking the players things in character teaches players who haven't played RPGs to answer in character. Yeah. And it helps like ease them into that. So all, all of those, mm -hmm. you know, even into the, the subject that we're talking about are things that are designed to help with that. Awesome. We actually have a couple questions from the chat that I want to make sure that we get to. Yeah, we uh, do. Um, the we first, do. the first one is, uh, I, I, I'll let me grab this one and you want to grab the no, next good. one? Yeah, good. Awesome. Uh, this is a question from Raving Sock Monkey. Uh, I got a question for John and Doug, um, out of the different playbook character archetypes, what are your personal favorites? Boy, <laughs> let me grab my book. So I know exactly <laughs> since we've done, uh, let's see. I really like the conspiracy the, the conspiracy theory mm -hmm. uh character yeah like whether you play it as a teen or an adult i think they're both fantastic mm -hmm. like you can play that adult that's on the fringe the fringe of society that kind of lives in a cabin or you can play the teen that's just kind of you know has just discovered weed and thinks everybody's out to get him <laughs> and has it spanned his mind so I, I it's a really fun trope to play i think it also yeah i like that one because it also thematically lines up with your your story elements right it's the fun with the person who oftentimes finds redemption in being either kind of right or more right than they could ever imagine mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and uh we we actually have a uh character uh latia jakis that plays a uh conspiracy therapist sorry th theorist mm -hmm. um and we basically came up with this thing th through the questions that 
she has a rivalry with the local DJ because she keeps trying to share her conspiracy theories since the DJ has this platform, but she's not being heard. <laughs> um, so yeah, just it, it just opens up all kind of g- g- great avenues. Um, oh, that's so good. For it. My two favorites, I think, are the the funny sidekick um, mm-hmm. because I really like the 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 characters who are sort of like I'm here for support. Um, and I also really like the wannabe. I really like that idea of like being on the outside and that sort of like, cause I super identify that from my high school years of like mm-hmm. being, not being the cool kid, but being like, but it's so easy. Like they're all just right there. And like, I do the things they do. Why am I not? Uh, right. And so I, I think that also has like really good places to go with more serious role playing and more like, more change over time. Whereas the funny sidekick, if I'm doing a one-off is like the one that I want to go to for like, okay, well, we're going to have some laughs and it's going to be this like silly kind of gravity falls inspired kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I'll be the, that's probably guy. my second favorite. Yeah. Sidekick. I'll, I'll never forget, yeah. what, forget the, uh, what, what did we call that character? The fart triloquist? Fart triloquist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that. I, I really like the, the, what's it called? The, sidekick because it's like i don't know i think about narratives that i really enjoy and they're like people who are a b plus grade at whatever they're working on like they're Mm -hmm. good but they're not like they're not the best and like that that is such good like for me oh i love it i love reading those stories um it just it just feels like it feels so relatable and also like where good narrative can drive from um I think, uh, Sharif, you want to check out this other question? Yeah, yeah. So the second question is from Glipster. says, how did you come up with the idea to use all kinds of dice for the system from D4 to D20? Since I mostly see other systems limiting the kind of dice n- needed mostly to D6s, D10s, or, uh, or another combination. So like, how did you decide on the dice that you wanted to use? That was a big part of that was our homage to D and D, right, um, right, right. And then the when initially we were thinking about this as a Stranger Things game, um, trying to pay pay homage to that in the in the show, um, but then it just it it worked out so nicely with the stats that we just kind of couldn't. I mean, I couldn't imagine getting rid of it at this point. And for new players, too, who haven't played RPGs, give them an excuse to go out and buy a full set of cool yeah. dice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not just a bunch of D6s right. that they probably... I mean, having a common die like D6s is nice because you can just steal them from another game like Monopoly, but mm-hmm. having cool dice is fun. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and like nowadays, and you can go to like a Target or mm-hmm. any store, which is kind of amazing to think about. You can go to any store and buy... Yeah like a set of d20 dice now it's pretty amazing or also like i mean your game's available on roll 20 so you don't don't even have to like own die you can just like roll virtually or you there are now so many systems um yeah i i really we talked a little bit about it earlier as well um but i i want to get actually stick on this a little bit because um the second part of this question i thought was really interesting too is like how much math was done to check if it works out and I, I want to ask that in relationship to the way you guys want narratively driven skill checks, like where you're like, hey, this is what a seven to nine means. And so like comparative with those skills. Yeah. What what is that? I, I know we've been talking a lot about playtesting, but I don't know like how that sort of conversation came out. I, I know I wrote up a bunch of stuff somewhere about this dungeon. I don't remember where it was. Was it RPG Beat? Mm-hmm. Somebody was talking about the percentile because really, you have a slightly higher percentage of beating the average of a six-sided die with a four-sided die with explosions. Mm-hmm. But it's very, very, it's a very small difference. Right. Um, well, sort sort of. It, it depends what your target number right. is. But yeah. 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 In the, I mean, the math works out when we when we uncapped explosions it threw it off a little bit Uh but again we wanted those big moments and there's there's a thing in game design that i like to call fun balancing where a thing is like you can make it very mathematically balanced but it's not fun 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes you have to like take those numbers and kick them around a little bit and be like, well, this isn't, uh, this isn't really fair, but it's really fun when the players do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying yeah, to, it's, I'm it's popping on board game geek. I'm going right? to try to find that link. I'll put it in the zoom. Oh, that's great. We can then throw it into the Twitch cool. chat. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it's 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 like part of the art of design that I've heard from everybody, from people that do video games, from people yeah. that program in any way. There's like the technical part, but there's also like the yeah. does it really feel good if mm-hmm. like Mario like jumped at a gravity on Earth, <laughs> even though it's real? You yeah, know? yeah. If he, if he could jump a realistic amount, the Mario game <laughs> wouldn't be fun at all, right? Nope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like always about like that art of like what feels good. You know, and, and I'm sure that that's like the last part of getting the game to feel great. And we really focused on that feeling during playtesting. You know, we made sure to check in with the players a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, asking like if you know if it felt useful to use the smaller dice, or if you felt like you know you should always use your bigger dice, and you know, making sure that there weren't trends in the gameplay that disrupted the fun. Mm-hmm. I think also like with adversity tokens coming in to like serve as a nice little buffer sometimes like for those moments. Um, yeah, those feel really satisfying when they do happen, when you do pass that skill check um, or when you just explode a roll, right? Uh, I know you guys have also um, and like your team have been a part of uh, not only kids on bikes, but like kids on brooms and uh, some other games. This is a personal question. What is the next iteration is it kids on cyber wheels is it kids uh on spaceships like wh- where where do you guys feel uh this sort of thematic ride takes you? well we we did teens in space teens in space very yeah good. so we got to do we i i think dud will agree with we, t- we a little bit regret the teen's name <laughs> um like now we've decided to just stick with the kids kids x yeah, yeah, yeah. Theme. Um, yeah. but teens in space was like our they, they kind of gave us a few options when we mm-hmm. talked to renegade and hunters and everybody threw some ideas in um i think everybody kind of really wanted us to do kids on bikes or kids yeah, on yeah. brooms uh-huh. um but then we we're like well what if we do space first because that's the one we're excited about um yeah we were we were about halfway through it when when Scott mentioned the name Kids on Brooms and we were like, yeah, that's the next one, but we got to wrap this one up first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think we can say what the next one is, but we're working on it. Okay, uh, all right. Kids on a break. <laughs> kids on a break. <laughs> yeah, Understandable. Kids on a break a little bit. That's good. Yeah. Um, it's, it's one that Doug immediately said he didn't want to do, and then I showed him some media that convinced him otherwise. Yep. Heck yeah. Very cool. I, I, yep. I, I'll take that teaser. That That is a comfortable place to appease my appetite we'll tell you after the stream <laughs> okay cool cool cool, cool. <laughs> Ooh, for me only um <laughs> but yeah i know i really uh like the sort of direction that, that uh kids on bikes leads for folks um i think it's definitely inspired me as someone who i mentioned like i've i run the campaign for rivals i've done one other game um, but i haven't really delved into it uh, <coughs> like i'm excited to play more and in it, uh, yeah. looking forward to checking out, the, now that I, I'm, I'm ashamed of it, I did not know about Teens in Space before this moment. And now to like think about it, it's like, that's great. I have so many ideas. Is it Star Trek? Is it Star Wars? Is it, ah, I gotta, I gotta find out. <laughs> what do you want it to be? <laughs> exactly. And see, that mm, is the answer that I thought sorry. it would ask me. Uh, <laughs> Get that index card. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of the cool thing we did with Teens in Space was instead of having the powered character, mm-hmm. you shared control of the ship and you customize the ship and gain points that you can put into it mm-hmm. to make your ship cooler. I love that. That's it, obviously it, in those medias, like in, which I also really appreciate. It feels like you all do your, do a lot of homage in the right way to uh, like the genre or source material that you all are like building out for us to play in. Um, mm-hmm. And like, I really like uh, thinking about, yeah, I really like the idea of the spaceship. It's like everyone oftentimes in those things, like if we look at uh, Firefly, if we look at all these other shows, like everyone is also a crew member alongside mm-hmm. of anything else they are. I even made the argument that like Guardians of the Galaxy is a teens in space movie. Like even though they're all adults, like yeah. no, they're, they're pretty mm-hmm. much teenagers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's in the in the rules about like you don't necessarily have to be 
in that adolescent range for whatever species you are. Yeah. But you have really bad impulse control. Whatever it is, <laughs> um, your fatal flaw is just always picking at you to like go do that one thing that you know you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So um, I should say though, uh, back to the question about what's next, we have a couple yeah. things that have been announced that we are allowed to talk about. Um, four teams in space, we have, uh, we did uh, Strange Adventures volume one and volume two for kids on bikes. Um, we're doing, I don't think we've settled on the exact name for it. It's, it's not space adventures because we don't want another essay. Um, but uh, we have two four-part adventures written by um, people who did adventure prompts in Strange Adventures Volume 2. Very so uh, Kristen and Tim Devine, who did uh, the North Sea Epilogues role-playing game, mm -hmm. put together a really sandboxy kind of four-part adventure. Um, and then Cleo Yunsu Davis, who did uh, No Such Place as Koreatown in the um, in Strange Adventures Volume Two, uh, is putting together more of a linear four-part adventure for uh, for teens in space. And then in the sort of universe, this was just recently announced, and I'm really glad I can start talking about it. Yeah. Um, Luke Minch, who's a buddy of mine who does a lot, a lot of play testing um, with me. Uh, he and I worked on a card game that wasn't originally in the Kids on Brooms universe, but uh, mm -hmm. sort of fit naturally in called Duel of Wands, a two-player heads-up mm -hmm. card battling game Very cool. where you're trying to sling spells at your opponent. And so that'll be coming out. I don't know that there's an official announcement date yet, but Renegade has officially stated that it's coming. So now I'm allowed to do this. Heck yeah. Awesome. Well, got we got to keep our eyes peeled. Those sound awesome. I also like... For folks who are excited about this media, who want to check out Kids on Bikes or any of these games, um, particularly for Kids on Bikes, I'd recommend the House on uh, Poplar Court. Like, it's a great introduction to the world and like what's to. They even have some like already pre-designed characters that you can sort of build out in your own way. Um, that's available on Roll Twenty. I that's how we ran it. Um, but yeah, it's it's very. Uh, very new a new player friendly or even an expert level player yeah ryan did an excellent job with that that was our yeah. free rpg day two mm -hmm. years ago i think yeah mm -hmm. awesome all right well um i think uh th thank y'all so much for joining us is there anything that you want to leave the people with uh, maybe socials or things that you're working on or uh things like that let's start with uh john any Anything you want to share with the audience? Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter at John Gilmore, J-O-N-G-I-L-M-O-U-R. Um, I don't think I have anything I can announce right now uh, as far as stuff I'm working on, but I mean, keep an eye on Twitter or, you know, uh, Board Game Geek or RPG Geek um, is a good place to watch. Okay, sweet. And Doug? Uh, I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Levzilla, L-I-V-Z-I-L-L-A, um, which is a joke that one of my students made, and uh, I didn't think I'd be using Twitter that much when I put it up, <laughs> but, um, and uh, yeah, so big upcoming stuff. Um, I just recently put out a game called Aunt Agatha's Attic, uh, which is a uh, real-time trading card game uh, about squabbling cousins so uh you have two minutes to get as much stuff uh from your aunt's house as she'll give you um and uh what else can you play um, that as adults because that feels that feels meaner as <laughs> as an adult <laughs> you should absolutely play it as adults yeah okay cool um, yeah it's uh that came out from chronicle books um and it's available i think pretty much everywhere um, yeah. And then keep an eye on Twitter. Um, I have a, a Kickstarter actually coming next week, I think really soon, um, for a game I worked on over the summer with somebody who interned with me, uh, called Arcane Zoo, which is a journaling game about running a magical zoo. Oh, um, mm, very cool. So that'll, that'll be up real soon. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's everything announced a couple other things in the works, but nothing, nothing official. 
Best way so. to keep in touch is follow you both on Twitter to keep all those yeah. updates. Yeah. Yeah. And we love to hear about people's games. We love to hear about like the crazy stuff that happens, those big moments like John was talking about. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, we, we were, uh, I don't know if this is a big moment, Masood, but we were chased by leaf people. Was, uh... <laughs> <laughs> leaf For, people? From an, yeah, a leaf men created from an ancient uh, ritual to uh, ball, you know, do the standard stuff. <laughs> You gotta watch those ancient rituals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very standard. Uh, anything you want to share, like Masood, before we get out of here? Um, yeah, hey, follow us at Rivals of Waterdeep. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Marood Boy. Um, yeah, we'll be back on our channel playing uh, the second session of uh, Ki- Rivals on Bikes. Uh, we're really excited about that, sponsored by Blue Microphones. Um, and then we'll also be doing a show for uh, PAX, and we're, yeah, yeah it's gonna be great. Oh, awesome. Big, busy day. Yeah. 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 So, so, uh, t- t- tomorrow at noon central, um, is, is our kids on bikes game. Mm-hmm. Um, and then right after, um, <laughs> on the, uh, PAX channel is our, uh, Rivals of Waterdeep, our D and D uh, show. So that's three games in four, four days. Yeah. Cause we have the one last night too. Yeah. And that last night. So that my butt imprint's going to be so strong in that chair. I tell you what. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, once, w- once again, Doug and John, thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Um, oh, thank so you all to everybody out in the chat and watching. Um, if you're watching this on the VOD or listening to the audio podcast, make sure to check our Twitter w- when we announce our live streams and all that stuff at Rivals Waterdeep. Uh, for that, we will be out. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone.